think right now, not about anything else, not about when are we going to be over, what's going to happen after tonight, but in these next few precious moments that we have got together, that God has ordained for you to be here in this very moment, I want you to begin to think about what am I going to do when I go home? What is it that God has been calling me to do, to go and do? To go and do when I go back, when I fly back home, when I drive back home? What is it that God has put on my heart to do? I want you to begin to wrap your minds around that in these next few moments. Because the reality is, is this, is that we can come and we can worship and we can raise our hands and, and we can lift our voices to God and, and we can sit in the classes and, and we can do all the things that we've done. But the reality is, is this, is that we need to be doers of God's word and not just hearers. We need to put into practice. We need to begin to live what we read in God's word. And oh, how I hope, oh, how I hope that you have God's word written in your heart so you may not sin against him. One of the things that we're going to talk about this evening really quick is this, is that, that not only do we need to come to Jesus and have a relationship with him and, and be able to have this experience, but for, in order for us, when we go back, there's a component, there's a, something that we need to be living out in our lives. There's a, a key ingredient, if you will, in our walk with Jesus Christ is this, is that we need to be people of compassion. We need to be people of compassion. If you have your Bibles, it's going to come up on the screen, and we're going to, we're going to dive into God's Word here this moment, just this, this evening, just for a few moments. And this passage of Scripture is in Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and this is the record that Matthew records of Jesus. And Jesus is going around and he is preaching and he is teaching. And, and just prior to this, in, in chapters uh, 8 and 9, you see, if you read it, you see Jesus doing all kinds of miracles. And he's at the peak. He's at the pinnacle of his ministry. And this is what Matthew records about Jesus. It says this in chapter 9, verse 35. It says, Jesus went out through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, here it is, he had compassion. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. I want to ask you a question. Are you compassionate? Are you somebody who is full of compassion? I want to tell you a quick story about a man by the name of Pedro Claver. Pedro Claver lived in the mid-1600s, and he was a Jesuit priest. And Pedro Claver was somebody who was compassionate. See, he lived in a town in Cartagena, Colombia, where he was there. And in this town is where, after they would round up slaves from Africa, they would bring them into this place. And this was the first taste of what was waiting for them as they got off the ships. You see, Pedro Claver lived in Cartagena where, where they would bring these slaves and, and he would see these slaves coming into Cartagena. He would see their suffering. He would see their anguish. He would see their pain. And so what Pedro Claver would do is he would gather foods of, uh, baskets of food and he would bring clothes and, and he would bring medicine. And what he would do is he would begin to minister to those slaves as they walked off the ships. It goes on to record as you talk, as you read about Pedro Claver, there's, it talks about the smells and the disgustingness that he saw on those slaves. But Pedro Claver, because he was a lover of Jesus, because he was some that surrendered his life to Christ, because he was a man that was filled com with compassion before what Jesus did for him on the cross, he didn't see the sickness, he didn't see the disease, he didn't see them in their own mess, he didn't see the suffering, he saw souls that were suffering and needed Jesus' love. Because he was a man of compassion. Not only would Pedro Claver go down to the docks and, and wait for these slaves to come off the, the ships, but he would begin to do something even more important than we, uh, uh, cleaning up their wounds and, and giving them food and giving them clothes, but he would begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. 
He would begin to talk to them and, and tell them how much there's a God that loves you and a God that cares for you and a God that even though you're in these circumstances, even though you are bound, that you can be free through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to be people of compassion that see people who are suffering and need the living Savior that we have. How dare we keep it to ourselves? How dare we keep it to ourselves that we need to go and share the love of Jesus with people in our homes, with people who live across the street from us, with people who are in our churches and in our cores. We need to see them as Pedro saw these slaves. That we need to look out for not only just their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. I'm going to ask you this evening again, are you people of compassion? What is it that God is calling you to go and do when you leave this place? You know, it's interesting that, that records show that because of the ministry of Pedro Claver way back in the mid-1600s, he did this for about 35 years. And there are numerous, there are numbers and numbers and numbers of people, of slaves that were saved. And as they would go and as they were bought and as they were sold and as they would go around the Western world and they would end up even in the United States, that you can trace, you, there's historians that have traced the gospel of Jesus Christ spreading into America, the United States, directly from the slaves that came through Colombia because of the work of Pedro Claver. We never know how far God will take us and use us if we are people of compassion. When you look at the scriptures that we read just a few moments ago, when you look at these scriptures, Jesus goes through all these towns and all these villages preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, when Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the one who the Bible says that we need to be imitators of, when he saw the crowds, being harassed. What does he have? He has compassion. What is compassion? What is compassion? Compassion is not just a word that we just say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a passionate person, I'm, I'm full of compassion, but there are three things you need to know tonight about compassion, and it is this. That first, compassion is, is where you assume a need. You see a need. Being compassionate is seeing a need. What are the needs in your town, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your own home, and within your own relationships? What are the needs that need to be met? Not only do you see a need, but you are, you are moved by it. Pedro Claver was moved by the suffering that was going on with those slaves. Are you moved with compassion? Are you being stirred up inside when you see the person sleeping on the street? Are you moved inside? Are you feeling something when you hear about those, the girls that are forced into uh, the sex slave trade? Are you moved? Are, is something stirring within your spirit when you hear about kids who are being abused? Are you moved? Are you stirred with something going on inside when you see the person sleeping on the street? When you hear about kids who are being bullied? When you hear about the person being kidnapped? Are you being moved? Is something happening inside of you? Are you feeling it? It's so easy for us. It's so easy for us to become so distracted and we're so focused on ourselves that we just walk on by and we miss the suffering that is so much around us. We need to be people of compassion that not only do we see the need, not only do we feel the need, but here's what happens is we need to do something about it. What, it is, what is it that God is wanting you to do something about that he's put on your heart this week? Maybe it's to do something about going back and, and dealing with some type of sin in your life. Maybe it's putting a block on your, on, your, on your computer. Maybe it's breaking a relationship. Maybe it's hanging out with a different type of people. I don't know. Maybe it's God is putting something in your heart so you can begin to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in some way, in some form with, with your friend that you go to school with, with your coworker, with your family, or whomever it is. What is it that God is calling you to do? What is it that God wants you to go and do? We need to feel, we need to see what's going on. We need to feel what's going on and we need to do something about it. What did Jesus do? Jesus saw that these people were harassed. That word harassed, when you look in the original uh, Greek language, it literally means this. It means to be beaten down. It means to be discouraged. It means to be hopeless. And why were these people beaten down? It's because Jesus says they are lost. 
They're spiritually lost. Not only are they physically being held down by, by what was going on at that time with the Romans and, 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 and treating them badly and keeping them down and harassing them, but they were like lambs without a sheep, without a shepherd. They were lost spiritually. They were being harassed. And who's being harassed in your sphere of influence? Who are the people that are being harassed in your sphere of influence when you leave this place? And are you going to be somebody who sees that? Are you going to be somebody who feels something about that? And are you going to be somebody who does something about that? What was the response to Jesus when he saw them being harassed? Well, it's in verse 35. He is, he is preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and he is healing their sicknesses. He's taking care of them physically, and he's also taking care of them spiritually. We need to make sure that we are doing the same, that we are taking care of people physically, maybe, maybe, maybe being a friend with somebody, maybe going out of our comfort zone and talking to that person in school or in college or whomever it is that you pass every single day and you see them all by themselves. Maybe it's taking a step of faith and, and going to talk to your neighbors and knock on the door and say, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm here. Let me tell you something. I got some weird neighbors that live next door to me. These guys are like, they're like Star Trek people and they have like swords and they're doing sword fights out in their yard and they're always talking about Star Wars and all kinds of weird stuff. And, and I'm like, man, those guys are freaky. They're weird, man. But you know what the reality is, is that I need to see them as someone who is suffering. Why? Because they're not in relationship with Jesus Christ. It does no good for me to go all the way to Africa, to go all the way to Colombia, to go all the way across the world if I'm not willing to go across the street. We say amen, but are we doing it? We say yes, amen. That means I agree with you, but are you really doing it in your life? And the reality is, is God is the only one that knows if you're really doing it. It's not good enough for us just to say yes, but we need to actually do something about it. What is God calling you to go and do when you leave this place? What is God calling you to go and do? Jesus saw that there was suffering. And he met the physical need and he met the spiritual need. Are you willing to go and do? Are you willing to go and, and talk to the people, even maybe within your own family? Let me tell you something, man. It is the hardest thing. It is the hardest thing to be a Christian, to be a, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and to have your life sold out for Jesus Christ. But it's one of the hardest things to do is to minister and to witness to your own family. But yet God calls us to minister to every single person that comes into our sphere of influence. And yes, it's good to go out and experience things overseas. Yes, it's good to go and get out of our comfort zone and, and to start making sandwiches and put kits together and, and do that type of outreach. But the reality is, is that we need to be able to do that same thing, have that same mindset, that same mentality of compassion within our own sphere of influence. And each and every one of us has a sphere of influence. There is nobody in this room that does not have a sphere of influence when you leave this place. And God is wanting us to be a people of compassion, where you see the need, where you feel the need, and you do something about it. You do something about it. And the reality is this, is that I know right now in this very moment that God has brought some stuff to the forefront of your mind where you know, man, you're, God is saying, yeah, Roy, I need to go. I need to go and talk to my friend. I need to go and talk to my neighbor. I need to go and, and, and do these things. And God has given us this opportunity right now in this very moment to make that commitment and say, yes, I'm going to go. You know, we talked about those four stories in the New Testament, and the, and the one thing that they have in common is that in all four of those stories is that you had to go to Jesus first. They all went to Jesus for something, to receive the blessing, to receive the healing, to receive salvation. They all went to Jesus, and we've had that experience that we've been able to come to Jesus and, and surrender and ask him to forgive us of our sins, and we've asked him into our lives, and, and we've had time to, to talk together as groups and to get into our, our cabin groups and discuss and, and, and talk and work these things out. But now it comes down to you and your relationship with God. It comes down to you and what God is putting on your heart right now in this very moment of what it is that he wants you to go and do when you leave this place. 
Are you people of compassion? You've got to see the need. You've got to feel the need, and you've got to do something about it. This is what I'd like every single person to do in this room. Every single person in this room. Every single person, I just want you to close your eyes and to bow your head. And I want you to ask yourself this question to your own heart and your own life. I don't care what your position is. I'm talking to the youth department. I'm talking to the officers. I'm talking to every single person that is in the sound of my voice. And I want you to ask yourself, am I truly a person of compassion? Are there needs in my neighborhood, in my community, within my sphere of influence that I'm seeing? Or am I just Am I just walking by and not paying any attention? Are there people that are suffering around me that, that I know, it, that I know that I can do something about, that I know that I can go and talk to that person or sit by that person? Because the reality is this, I said it earlier and I'm gonna say it again, that the Bible tells us that we need to be a doer of God's word and not just a hearer. We need to be a doer of God's word and not just to hear, and we need to be willing, every single person in the sound of my voice, including myself, that we need to be people of compassion. Are we looking? Are we looking for the needs that are around us where people are suffering? Pedro Claver saw a need. He saw people that were suffering physically. He ministered to them spiritually. Think about the people within your own home. Those people in your own home that desperately, desperately, desperately are lost, that are being harassed in so many different ways. Am I being compassionate to them? The people in our community who are that we see every single day, who are being harassed in in so many ways, and are we taking time to, to stop and to see and to feel and look at them through the lens of Jesus Christ? It's interesting that Jesus says in that passage of Scripture at the very end, he says that, that the fields are ready, the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Not only do we need to pray for the laborers, as Jesus says, but we need to make ourselves available to do the work as well. What is it that God is wanting you to do when you leave this place? I want you to think about that. I don't want you to drift off. I don't want you to start losing focus. I want you to think about that right now. Bring to mind right now in this very moment, what is it that God has placed on my heart that he wants me to do, that he wants me to deal with, that he wants me to go back and be a part of? Maybe it's being a better husband. Maybe it's better being a better friend, a better wife. Maybe it's being a better student. Maybe it's being a better pastor. Maybe it's being a better worker, a co-worker. Maybe it's, it's, it's sharing the gospel with the person that sits across from us. Maybe it's simply just stopping and talking to people in your neighborhood. I am so thankful that God, when he looked down on humanity, had compassion for us that he had compassion for me, and he knew that that Roy Wilde was gonna be a sinner lost in his own sin. He was gonna be a lost sheep that was being harassed because of his sinfulness, and he willingly sent his son Jesus Christ on the cross to die for me and to raise three days later, and because of that, I have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And that's what Jesus has done for you by showing compassion for you, and we need to do it for others. So how's that going to play out in your life? 
when you leave this place. This is what I would like to happen in these next few moments. And I don't want you to drift off. I want you to stay focused because, God, I really believe that we need to honor what God has been doing in our lives. And, and we need to listen and be willing to be obedient. But this is what I want. You are handed a piece of paper, a, a card, and, and a pen. And what I want you to do with that pen and that paper, it just simply says, what am I going to go and do? What am I going to do? And I want you to do this. I want you to spend some time in prayer. I want you to be thinking about this. And I want you to just think about what is it that God wants me to do. And I want you to go ahead and I want you to write that down. I want you to write that down. I want you to spend some time thinking about that and, and write that down. This is not just something that is just a kind of, just a simple thing. I want you to really stop and think, what is it that God has wanted me to do? And in these next few moments, as we just kind of worship a little bit, and as, as you guys are spending time in prayer, talking to God, and, and just maybe just kind of working this stuff out, this goes for every single person in this room. This is not just for the delegates. This is not just, it's for everybody. It's for our youth department staff. It's for the media. It's for everybody. It's for our divisional youth secretaries. And this is what I want to happen is this. Because I believe that God places people in our lives to help us, to encourage us, to keep us accountable. And in these next few moments as we worship and as we pray and as you write things down, what I'm going to ask is first is this. I'm going to ask first for the divisional youth leaders when you are ready to come and, and to say this is, this, is what, this, is what, this is what God wants me to do. I and my wife, we want to pray with the divisional youth leaders. And we just want to pray a prayer of blessing upon you and a, a prayer of encouragement as you yourselves go back and go and do what God has placed on your hearts to do. And then this is what's going to happen is this, is that after this, after we pray with the divisional youth leaders, they are going to go and they're going to spread themselves out around the room. And what I want you to do is I want you, when you're ready, when you're ready and you know what God, it is that God wants you to do, when you write that down, I want you to go and I want you to pray with your divisional youth leader and they're going to pray a prayer of blessing upon you they're going to pray a prayer of encouragement upon you and then you're going to stay with them and as more people come from your division you're going to you're going to be gathered as a divisional group praying for each other encouraging each other lifting each other up because the reality is is this is that not only do all of us have a sphere of influence but there's not one person in this room that is alone why because we are united in jesus christ that is our common ground And when you are in your divisional groups and you're all there, you guys are going to, the divisional leaders will pray, be praying for you. You'll be praying for those that come forward. And then when all your divisional group is there, when your divisional leaders are ready, then you guys are just going to go ahead and leave and you're going to go out the chapel and we're going to be done. Because the reality is, is this, is that God wants to do something in our lives and it doesn't start until we walk out those doors. We can talk about it. We can think about it. We can pray about it. But until we get up and we walk out those doors, it doesn't become a reality until we become obedient. And so, yeah, there might be a little bit of movement, and we might need to kind of move some chairs around as the, as the groups get a little bit bigger. But I want us to spend this time in God's presence, worshiping, being obedient, so we can be the compassionate followers of Jesus Christ, that we can be Jesus lovers, servants to all when we leave this place. Let's worship him. Captain Paul is going to come join me up here on the stage, and when the DYSs are ready, when you're ready, you come and we're going to pray for you. And as you see your divisional youth leader, as they go out to their location, their spot around the chapel, and you're ready to go, and you're ready to pray with them, and we're going to do it. So let's just spend some time worshiping him.